When I was a kid, around 10 years old, my older brother told me a scary story. Ever since, whenever this time of year comes around, it brings me back to that night. The memories come flooding back vividly, despite the fact that this all occurred over 20 years ago. At the grocery store, when I see the inevitable Halloween displays pop up in the seasonal section, when I see decorations on neighbors' lawns, gaudy displays of witches and tombstones, monsters and ghouls, cobwebs and, of course, pumpkins. Always and everywhere there are pumpkins. Driving out in the country, I'll see fields full of them, with farmers selling the orange and white monstrosities in their driveways, and I'll cringe and shudder. I'll begin to feel ice cold as if I'm in his presence once again. I'll start breathing quickly, my heart beating faster and faster in my chest until I begin to hyperventilate. I'll look out the other window, but soon enough it doesn't matter where I look. There are pumpkins everywhere, smiling with their toothy grins, candles flickering from within their empty skulls, watching me. Always watching me. Why do I despise the gruesome gourd so much? As I've said when I was around ten years old, my older brother told me a tale. It had come to him with a strange and impossible inspiration. He said later it was like the story had told itself through him without his conscious effort. It was only after we had left that he admitted to himself he was more than a little scared of what had happened. How he had gone into an almost trance-like state as he spoke, later forgetting most of what he had said as if it had all been a dream. It had started off as him trying to get rid of us, but had developed into something beyond his understanding. We were home alone, my parents out at a church meeting, and had been sitting around the living room, waiting for it to be dark enough outside to go trick-or-treating. It would be the last time I would be allowed to go out to collect candy from strangers on Halloween. My parents became born-again Christians, and we weren't allowed to go out again after that year. They had told me this would be the last time I would get to celebrate the demonic holiday, and they were only allowing it this time, since we were moving, and subsequently I would no longer get to be around my friends as much. It would be my last Halloween living in that house, and in the same city as my friends. We were moving out of town later that fall, so I was trying to get the most of my last days there with them. My parents understood that and allowed me this one last hurrah. You guys ever hear of uh, the jack o lantern My older brother asked casually, waiting for his turn to play Super Mario Kart. We were starting a new 150cc GP, and he was in line behind four of us. So it was going to be a while before he got his chance to play again. Unless, of course, he could get rid of us somehow. What's the jack o lantern My friend Greg asked. He was the most gullible of the four of us. You're so full of it, Dave. Chris slammed into a wall with his chosen Donkey Kong character and lost a lot of ground trying to catch up to the others again. Shit, why'd I pick this guy? He's so frickin' slow. Ryan, how'd you get Koopa Troopa again? You always take him. Well, you get to him first, you can have him next time, Ryan said. He was by far the most competitive when it came to any sort of video games, and he had a way of winning that I found mildly infuriating. All right, I guess you guys don't want to hear it. My brother loved to use reverse psychology on us. Of course it worked, as always. Come on, Dave, just tell us, Ryan said, momentarily distracted from the game. He sounded intrigued. What the hell is that anyway, some sort of urban legend? My brother Dave sat back, a small and devious smile playing at the corners of his mouth. He had us hooked. Now he just needed to reel us in. Nah, you guys didn't want to hear about it. It's too bad, really. It's actually a true story. It happened right near here. His face was sincere as he spoke. I looked at him, believing every word. Really? Oh, come on, man, just tell us. I begged and pleaded with him. After a few minutes, he relented. All right, all right, I'll tell you guys. You can't tell Mom and Dad, okay? This is pretty dark. I think you guys are old enough to hear it, though. He edged closer to us and began his story. So, about ten years ago, there was this guy named Terry. He lived a couple doors down over at the Robinson place. So anyways, Terry goes to work one day, right before Halloween. He worked over at the pumpkin farm on Highway 6. 
the video game was paused and we had now forgotten all about it. So it's busy there at the pumpkin patch. Because everybody's getting ready for Halloween and they're, they're buying everything up last minute. So Terry's really busy. He's working overtime, right? Terry does manual labor there, picking the pumpkins. But he also carves jack-o'-lanterns for the customers and charges $2 for the service. Splitting the dough 50-50 with the owner. Since he's pretty good at it and people are in a hurry, he's getting a lot of extra money, right? That night he's carving lots of pumpkin faces. But one guy catches his attention. Some creepy dude who's chanting under his breath while Terry carved his pumpkin. And when he hands him the money, there's a razor blade hidden in it. Terry doesn't even feel it cut him. Just sees the blood all over the pumpkin when he hands it to the guy. Dude runs off before he can call the cops. So anyways, by the time he's done for the day, it's almost dark outside, right? He figures it's a nice warm night, so he'll just walk home. Big mistake. He sets out from the farm just as twilight's setting in. He gets a mile or so from the house, and by then it's dark, right? And up ahead there's this guy standing in the middle of the street. Out there on this country road in the middle of nowhere. But this guy, he doesn't look right. His head's way too big. It's like it's the size of a beach ball, right? And Terry can't see it too well because there's not too many streetlights out on this country road. My brother had begun to speak in a strange way I hadn't heard before. His voice was sure and steady as he told the story, and there was no hint that any of this was a lie. All of us were listening intently as he continued on. So he's a little freaked out, right? But there's no other way into town, so he keeps going forward, and he just hopes this guy is alright, not a crazy person or something. He gets close to the guy and he asks him, what's he doing with a pumpkin on his head? Because as he gets closer, he realizes that's what it is, right? The guy's standing there with a carved jack-o'-lantern on his head. And Terry said later he wasn't scared for some reason, just figured it was some guy playing Halloween pranks. Terry was a big dude, like over six and a half feet tall, so he could take care of himself in a fight, right? Only thing he couldn't figure out was how he was making it look like there was a lit candle instead of his face inside the pumpkin. He figured it was some kind of special effect, like like the two iPad shirt or something, since that was the only rational explanation. He says to the guy, I just want to go home. And this guy, the jack o lantern, disappears into thin air. Poof! Just gone. So Terry's freaked out, right? He bolts back home, and he tells his parents what happened, and they lose it. They hug him, and they tell him he's lucky to be alive. They didn't speak the name of the jack o lantern out loud, because they knew it would draw him out. They said the jack o lantern only comes here on Halloween, and there's a certain way to summon him, although he doesn't always show up right where you expect him to. First you carve a pumpkin, while chanting these words. Through three-sided eyes we see your face, Flickering candlelight, we do embrace. Jack o' lantern, Jack o' lantern, show your face. Bring us into your dark embrace. We shuddered as he spoke the rhyme. He was now speaking as if completely hypnotized. His eyes blank and staring off into the distance a thousand yards ahead. And second, you must baptize the Jack o' lantern in the blood of the one to be visited. Third, you must set forth to search him out at twilight as the darkness takes over from the day. When it becomes completely dark with no sign of the sun, he will appear to you then. If you approach him unafraid and ask him what you desire, he will grant your wish. But if you lose your nerve, if you become scared and let terror take hold of you as you look into his impossible face with its carved eye holes, mouth and nose, only a flickering candle where the brain inside should be, he will take you with him into the perpetual blackness of the night. He will swallow you whole, and you will live forever in a state of terror for all eternity, in the pitch-black confines of his domain, serving only as a meal for him, as he feasts on your fear. My brother was breathing heavily. His face looked ashen and pale. He ran to the bathroom, and I heard him throwing up violently a moment later. We sat around in complete shock. The whole thing was true. In our minds, it had to be. He had told the story with a conviction and authenticity that were undeniable, and we couldn't help but believe every word. Before he could come back, we left the house and rode away on our bikes. 
trick-or-treating temporarily forgotten as we decided to go out searching for the jack-o'-lantern. Ryan said he had a pumpkin at his place that had not yet been carved, so we went there first. He grabbed a steak knife from the kitchen and we slashed open the top of the pumpkin and pulled the top off roughly. The four of us dug our hands in and scooped out its seed brains, tossing them in the garden without bothering to fetch a trash bag. Sitting on the back porch, we used the knife to cut a deep slash in each of our palms, our blood running together on the knife and all over our open wounds in a highly unsanitary way. We chanted the verses, as my brother had described, over and over. Using the bloody steak knife, we cut rough triangle-shaped holes in the flesh of the pumpkin and did another for the nose. I made jagged Nosferatu teeth for the mouth to give a surprisingly horrifying effect. The blood-smeared jack-o'-lantern stared at us hungrily, taunting us as we prepared for what was next. The four of us believed in our ability to overcome our fears. And what kid didn't want any wish they could think of to come true? I had already decided I would wish for a billion dollars or some other ridiculous amount so that we wouldn't have to move, and I could continue living near my friends. If we were rich, we wouldn't need to sell our house. So we rode off on our bikes just after the sun disappeared behind the horizon. Our destination was that same road where Terry had seen the jack o' lantern ten years before. Maybe we would get lucky and see him there again. Perhaps he would grant our wishes. The alternative never occurred to us. That our fear was not something that could be controlled, like turning off a tap of hot water before it scalds the skin. Fear is a canister of gasoline sitting near a blazing fire, just waiting to be tipped over and ignited. Fear is a primal instinct, fight or flight, an autonomic response, a precursor to the potential for survival. We arrived at the area where my brother had described Terry's encounter happening with the jack o lantern the sun was beginning to set, and we decided then and there that getting our wishes granted by this mysterious figure would be a far greater reward than any candy we could contemplate. Regardless, we vowed to spend no more than an hour searching, since trick-or-treating was still one of our top priorities as ten-year-olds. We had a pair of walkie-talkies and decided to split up into pairs to cast a wider net. Dave had told us that if we said the name out loud, it would draw him to us, so we decided to do just that. We shouted out his name as we rode around, foolhardy on our trusty bicycles, as if nothing in the world could do us harm. Oh, Jack o' Lantern, come out and talk to us. We want to see you. We're not scared, I shouted at the top of my lungs. A man standing on his front porch looked at me with wide and terrified eyes and ran inside his house, slamming the door shut behind him. There were rows and rows of corn past that house as the land began to turn into lengthy farmer's fields. I looked down each row as I went past, searching for the dark silhouette of a man with a pumpkin for a head. You guys see anything? I asked into the walkie-talkie. Nothing yet, said Chris. He and Ryan had gone off together, and Greg and I were riding by ourselves down the dimly lit country road. All right, keep looking, I said. We spent another hour paddling up and down gravel roads and paved ones, occasionally meeting up but never seeing anything. We split off into groups of two one last time and decided we would spend another 15 minutes searching. No more. After that, we would go back and hurriedly throw on our costumes and race around to as many houses as possible. I was starting to feel a bit like Dave had just been pulling my leg after all. Maybe it had just been an excellent fabrication told flawlessly to get us to leave so that he had the SNES all to himself. Wasn't that all a great story was, after all? Just a well-told lie. I didn't want to admit that to my friends, though, and continued pedaling along on my bike with Greg at my side. We spent the next ten minutes looking around with little enthusiasm. I was pedaling past a cornfield and looking at the rows as they stretched off perfectly straight into the distance. Each one had a gap in the middle that showed the well-lit sky above, with the large moon illuminating the night. Until I went past one and saw him. He was standing there, in the middle of the cornrows, blocking out the sky with his enormous pumpkin head. And through the holes carved in his orange flesh there were no features, but only the candlelight flickering dimly within. I almost lost control of my bike as I skidded to a stop, dropping it in the middle of the road. 
Greg stopped and turned around, leaving his bike on the ground as well and coming to stand beside me. Neither of us dared to touch the walkie-talkie. I had forgotten all about it, in fact. We stared down the corn row, speechless. The man with the pumpkin head didn't move. He simply stood there and watched us, his arms crossed. He appeared to be dressed in a dark robe, but it was hard to see with the lack of light. Suddenly Greg began to walk forward, looking hypnotized by the glow of the candlelight inside the man's pumpkin head. I heard him say something like, It's so beautiful, the way it flickers, in a half-whispering voice. Before I could react, he was running up to the jack o lantern to greet him like an old friend. He was laughing, giggling like a little kid much younger than his age. And that was when I realized what a stupid mistake it had all been going out there. Summoning this creature. This thing was not here to help us. Whatever wishes it granted would surely be secret curses like those received from a demon, a witch, or a monkey's paw. I stood there trembling for a few moments longer before gathering my courage. Greg was my friend, and I couldn't let him die like this. I willed myself to move forward. If I had to die for him to live, so be it, I thought. As I raced to try and overtake him in the cornrows, I realized it was going to be too late. I called out to him and then immediately regretted it. Greg, stop! I shouted. He was almost in the thing's clutches, I saw now. It was reaching out with arms that looked like twisted tree branches and vines, withered and knotted, crooked and ancient. The twig fingers elongated and reached out greedily as my friend approached. He stopped suddenly and I saw him begin to tremble violently with fear. Greg tried to turn around and run, but it was far too late for that. The twig fingers wrapped him up like a thousand tiny boa constrictors, as his saucer-wide eyes stared at me terrified. The branches creaked and stretched across his features and wrapped tight around his chest. They went under his eyelids and into his eyes and nose as he screamed. Into his ears, the creeping twigs went next, growing and stretching, invading his body. That was when I made the mistake of looking up and into the jack o lantern's horrifying face. I saw it was lumpy with warts and the orange flesh of the pumpkin skin stretched up and wrinkled in a malevolent grin. The flickering candlelight from within his skull seemed to laugh at me as he began to fade into the night, taking my best friend with him. Help! he said, then disappeared into darkness. I stood there, gasping for air like a fish out of water. My body began to shake and my chest heaved with a violent spastic motion. The world faded into shades of yellow and red. Then darkness. Jason? Greg? You guys want to call it quits? I heard the voices of my friends calling to me over the radio. I dropped it in the dirt and fell to my knees, my jaw hanging down, tears streaming from my eyes and landing in the soil beneath me. Hey, where are you guys? I see your bikes, but you're not... Oh, wait, there you are, Ryan said before the walkie-talkie cut out for good. I heard their footsteps coming closer from behind me, and they slowed as they reached my body lying prone in the dirt weeping uncontrollably. They didn't know what to say at first, but then pretty quickly got the picture. Was it him? Was it the... I shot up to my feet, dizzy and covered in dirt, the world fading in and out. I grabbed Chris roughly by his collar. Don't you ever say that name! I screamed in his face. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. We fled from that place quickly after that realizing suddenly how unsafe this world really was, now that common sense and rationality no longer applied. Pedaling home on our bikes, we abandoned trick-or-treating without a word, going home to tell our parents something, anything, to make them leave us alone. My stomach was upset. I didn't feel like trick-or-treating after all, I said. I couldn't bear to tell them until the next day. It was too fresh and too real still. Part of me hoped I woke up the next morning and would discover it all to be a dream, but of course that would have been too easy. My parents nodded their approval, and I went straight up to my room and lay in bed awash with emotions. Fear, grief, anxiety, dread, sorrow, and melancholy. But nothing better beyond that for a good long while. 
I decided after all this time to share this story from my past. To leave it here for you as a cautionary tale. Don't let your children make the same mistakes I did. Tell them. They can go out trick-or-treating, throw toilet paper at the neighbor's trees and decorate their lawns with it. Chuck eggs at cars and set bags of dog shit on fire. But teach them this. Warn them. Don't ever go out looking for the jack o' lantern Because you will find him. Today's video was supported by patrons like Mark from Earth, Crimson Muse, Joy Burton, Diane Showers, Mark Zwall, Cheryl James, Pick Your Sticker, Teddy Dog, Clue 404, Mamacado, Dante Kincaid, Zarin Ray, Angela Donovan, Larry Ann 50, Devin Kyle, Timothy Baird, Ajeti, Bert Turner, Bajani Espinal, Michael Pierce, Big Joe, Kerry Harkonnen, LaDonna Spivey, Scott Tanaka, Tom Stewart, Sherman Davis, Bryce Shelton, Susan McClendon, Elise Batisse, Lisa and the Cult Jam, Open Circuit, and Fabula Vore. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider joining my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Jordan Group Horror. As a patron, you'll get access to bonus videos and content. You'll be credited at the end of every video going forward, and if you decide to stay for three months, I'll name a character after you which will be featured in the next Hollow's End story. Links to join the Patreon are in the description. Thanks everyone for listening. Please like, subscribe, and comment to help the channel continue to grow, and see you again next time at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hope you have a great night.